So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. And um, on behalf of the IAEA, I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, to, to today's uh, webinar. It's great that we're joined by so many for this open and public event. And I'd particularly like to warmly welcome those of you who may be joining um, us for the first time. And we're delighted uh, to introduce you uh, in this way to the work of the IIEA. On June the 17th, Ireland was elected as a non-permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations and will serve on the Council for two years from January 2021. This was a hard-fought contest involving three very strong UN members, Canada, Norway and Ireland. With only two seats available, someone had to lose out and in the end, the seats were won by Ireland and Norway. This was undoubtedly an important diplomatic win for Ireland involving a huge campaign over several years by our politicians, the President, the Taoiseach, the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Tánaiste, and of course our diplomatic service. The result means that as a member of the Security Council, Ireland will be at the top table of global diplomacy, contributing to this very special program, uh, forum, and to the maintenance of international peace and security. Joining us today from New York is Ireland's permanent representative or ambassador uh, to the United Nations, who spearheaded our campaign in New York, and who will talk to us about the campaign and what it means for Ireland. Geraldine Byrne Nason has been Ireland's permanent representative in New York since 2017. Uh, prior to that, she served as our ambassador to France from 2014 to 2017. She is a career diplomat who has also served as Second Secretary General in the Department of the Taoiseach from 2011 to 2014, responsible for European issues, among others, as we worked our way through the financial crisis at that time. Geraldine will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, after which we will open in our usual way for questions and answers. Please use the Q&A function on your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can in the time available. And just to confirm, this event is on the record. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Geraldine and in doing so, extending our warmest congratulations on Ireland's election to the Security Council. So Geraldine, the floor, the platform is yours. Many thanks, Michael. Uh, good morning. Great to be back with IIEA friends. I'll admit to having spent many happy hours with you in the past uh, during the time you mentioned there, Michael, when I was in Marion Street. I was a, a frequent visitor, uh, exciting briefings on European Councils, EU IMF bailouts and such, uh, but now delighted to, uh, to be with you again with my, my sights obviously uh, clearly here in New York and as you said, uh, the big development recently, our election on the 17th of June as a, an elected member of the Security Council for two years and that starts in January next year. Now we came through, Michael, you said it was a tough competition. It was christened here by some commentators as uh, the group of death, seen I think in the UN corridors typically as, uh, as probably the toughest race uh, in, in Security Council election terms in modern UN history. So our, our election on the first round of that uh, uh, campaign was really seen as a, as a major achievement. Um, many of you watching today will know that elections to the Security Council uh, required that two thirds, uh, two thirds majority of the members of the UN present and voting on the day elect you. So with 192 countries voting on the day, we needed 128 votes, no small uh, bar, uh, to be elected to the Council. Most before the election actually thought that the Western group that we were competing in with Norway and Canada, the expectation was that that group would go to several rounds of election and um, perhaps not elect anyone at all on the first round. Notoriously, some Security Council elections have slugged it out for, in one case, 155 rounds back in 1980. And Netherlands and Italy, just in 2016, went five rounds. So, um, you know, these things can run. In the end, uh, we were very lucky uh, to be elected on the first round with exactly 128 votes. Norway was elected along with us in that first round. So two elected, big surprise, um, leaving Canada in third place and losing out for a seat. Um, 
some argued, uh, I'm saying a little word about the campaign first maybe, some, some felt that uh, on paper probably our two competitors had fairly strong competitive advantages against us. Norway clearly um, a wealthy country, a very generous development programme, Canada, G7, G20 player. Prime Minister Trudeau played a very personalised role here in the campaign in New York. Um, both Norway and Canada are, as we know, influential NATO members. Um, they both have many more diplomatic missions than we do globally. Um, they certainly had bigger campaign budgets and bigger teams. So they're just a few of the comparative advantages. So as I'm asked consistently now since the 17th of June, why did Ireland come through? Um, you know, without sounding like Pollyanna, um, uh, surprisingly in a cynical time, I'm inclined to see the result as a confirmation that actually at the end of the day, principles and values do really matter still. Even in this UN where elections and particularly elections to the Security Council are often painted as highly transactional, I think that the majority of voters on the day chose us for a sort of surety, as it were, an authenticity, a country that they can actually rely on. Uh, we always said in the campaign, with Ireland, what you see is what you get. We don't wax and wane at the UN. I think the result is also an indication of the positive perception of Ireland's own role in the world today. I'm um, happy to see that reinforced again yesterday with Pascal Donoghue's election uh, to the Eurogroup. Um, the decision taken here on the 17th of June by two thirds of the UN members, 128 countries, was one of really essentially putting their trust in Ireland to represent them at the Security Council. It, that's not something that countries do lightly. It's almost a sacred trust. So just a little bit on the nature of the campaign that we ran, which I think is, is not unimportant in the way we look to where we are now and where we will go on the Council. Um, if you leave the politics of the, of the election aside just briefly, um, and look at what the UN Charter itself says about electing someone to the Security Council, it says that members should be elected, and I'm quoting, with due regard to the contribution of members to the maintenance of international peace and security. Now, Ireland, I would argue, would be judged really by any reasonable observer as meeting those criteria. If you just look at our peacekeeping, our engagement on human rights, disarmament, humanitarian action, and also our sustainable development actions. But there's a step beyond that, um, and the campaign to be elected really requires that you prove your claim um, and that you demonstrate the case uh, for every vote, actually. So our mantra here was to never take yes for granted, never take no for an answer. Much of the focus till now has been on the campaign that we ran in the last two years, the one we famously launched by the East River, where we had the Taoiseach, uh, the Thonish, the Simon Coveney, we had Mary Robinson and Bono on the stage um, launching the campaign. In fact, this was a 15-year campaign. It was a long campaign, many actors building up in a complex enough way, I think, support over uh, more than a decade. We were lucky to have strong political support throughout the campaign on the island, with a cross-party support and that was an important issue not something that our two competitors enjoyed at all times um, and i just note en um, passant as it were uh, that in the background we had the minor matters of brexit general election a government formation and then covid to cope with so it wasn't an election without or a campaign without its own twists and turns on the way the government made its case through the Taoiseach uh, the permanently in motion, Thonishtha then, uh, Simon Coveney, Ministers of State Kieran Cannon, Helen McEntee, Pat Breen, Minister Catherine Zappone was a special Security Council envoy. So we were very well bolstered. President Higgins played a pivotal role, uh, including in particular, I would say, through his very powerful and persuasive public engagements in New York and in Dublin, as well as direct engagements he took with leaders in Africa, in Latin America, with the small island developing states. I feel that the authenticity of his voice and his message really registered right across the UN. 
I have to say that Mary Robinson was an extraordinary friend of the campaign. She gave not just of her time generously, but I would say also of her wisdom really freely. Her voice here on multilateralism and its challenges, her role as chair of the elders, they're deeply respected. And I was always del also delighted to work again with uh, Eamon Gilmore, highly regarded internationally and now um, with several important EU mandates. And he was a supporter and a real friend of the campaign. And of course, yes, uh, publicly, famously, we had Bono and Riverdance, thanks to, to John and Bill Whelan. Um, we also had artists like Colin Davidson and Brian Maguire. Poets like dear Evan Boland, um, they played significant parts. And for me, they were uh, important to the campaign in communicating what I think of as the intangible messages about what we are and what, what we are as a people in Ireland. Uh, that really registered. Bono also worked with us on a big policy initiative. Um, we took uh, that earlier in this year on uh, girls and education. We called it the Drive for Five. I have to say that Bono's reputation as a humanitarian, sometime rock star singer as well, of course, uh, really helped us to project messages. So it was clearly a Team Ireland effort, and that's absolutely true. They were the bigger public faces. Back home, of course, it was a campaign that touched absolutely everyone in my own uh, department, my mothership, the Department of Foreign Affairs. I don't think there's a colleague at home or abroad who wasn't it tipped on the shoulder to play a role uh, at one level or another in the campaign. We had really a crack Security Council team in Ivy House, led by Niall Burgess, Brendan Rogers, Frank Smith. They coordinated our missions right across the network. And they also conducted a, a team of envoys, um, a highly able group of current and former diplomatic colleagues who had basically responsibilities in regions and countries where we don't have missions on the ground. And that was an invaluable support. It included um, many of my illustrious predecessors in this role in New York. Uh, Richard Ryan, who last had the privilege to be at the helm when Ireland was on the council in 2001-2002. Um, we had David Cooney, our former Secretary General, and of course my own immediate predecessor here and friend David Donoghue of SDG fame. Uh, in New York, Brian Flynn, an amazing deputy perm rep, and myself led a brilliant team of young diplomats here who really put their heart and soul into this effort. It was a sort of a once in a lifetime for them. Um, I always call it an extreme sport for diplomats, a, a Security Council campaign. So quite literally right around the clock for over two years, we engaged with every one of the other missions, 192 missions, the ambassadors, their teams, their election officers on multiple occasions. We were looking for areas of common interest here, opportunities to work together, co-sponsoring initiatives, supporting their own efforts, speaking up on issues that mattered to them, not just that mattered to us. And frankly, we went back again and again to secure each vote and then again and again to retain it. Uh, I, quite literally, we left nothing on the field. Um, if I come a bit to the substance and to the sort of core values that we built the campaign around, we distilled them into three. Uh, we called them independence, partnership and empathy. And I'll say a quick word on each of those because at the end of the day, they're not abstract concepts. We, they were actually... Um, core hearts of the campaign and spoke to the way we, we ran our business here um, for the campaign. Independence, that's really a characteristic that speaks of course to every member of the UN, but I would say in particular to the hundred states, um, which are small states, called here small states, with populations of under 10 million. Um, like Ireland, every one of those smaller states relies on the multilateral system, not just to provide stability, but actually to enable it to engage globally. And 80 of those 100 countries were actually born, uh, they were decolonized as part of the UN system. So they're deeply anchored and rooted and their trust is very much in the UN system. We argued all along that the campaign in an increasingly um, fragmented and I must say very much a polarized environment in such an environment that Ireland would bring a uniquely independent voice to the council. 
Um, a key differentiation is often mentioned to me uh, now post campaign, but it came up during the campaign, was that we're not part of any military alliance. And as such, to quote Minister Coveney, a, a phrase he often used in the campaign, was that we're beholden to no one. The states who are voting in, a campaign, in a, an election like the Security Council are very conscious of the difficult decisions that face the council, issues with a very wide ranging uh, complexion. So whether or how to address climate crisis as a security issue on the council. How do you protect civilians in Syria? What will you do in the event of a possible annexation uh, in the West Bank? So for issues like that, right across the board, countries know that they need an independent voice at the table. They also knew that Ireland had form in respect of independence at the Security Council. If I go back to uh, when Noel Dorr led the team here in 1981-82, we faced uh, the Falklands Malvinas crisis on the Security Council, and we were seen to take an independent stand then. In October 2001, when Richard Ryan was in the seat, in the aftermath of September 11, uh, we held the presidency of the Security Council, and we were true to ourselves then too. We more recently here last year stood up for uh, uh, independence in a, in a General Assembly vote on the tiny Chagas Islands, uh, where the UK was a key player and Ireland supported the tiny island of Mauritius in an unfinished business on decolonization. That was seen, uh, we were supporting an ICJ judgment, it was seen as an independent stance that we took. So on the second element in the campaign, we, we addressed partnership. In many ways, this was probably the easiest um, case to make. I think Ireland is very much seen here on the ground in the UN as an exemplary partner. Um, we're recognized, we like to say, as a bridge builder by nature, but it's actually true in practice. And certainly when I arrived here three years ago, the extraordinary work done by David Donahue and by his excellent New York colleagues like John Gilroy here, shepherding the 2030 agenda across the line alongside Kenya, that was deeply respected work and seen as constructive goodwill partnership. Building on that, when I arrived, I chaired the Commission on the Status of Women for two years. I'll tell you that was a complex, politically difficult terrain to negotiate 10,000 delegates annually. Um, we had to work right across constituencies, I'd say actually hemispheres. Um, uh, remarkably, we managed to agree conclusions both years. And I think that stood us, that was sort of a, almost money in the bank as a capable, reliable hand at the tiller. And these things matter when people look to you as a likely player on the Security Council. I wanted to draw attention though today to one thing that's quite extraordinary that emerged as a partnership really out of the campaign. It was sort of an organic uh, thing uh, that grew from the campaign. And that's a partnership that prospered with the small island developing states, 38 of them. We call them the SIDS for short. I think this partnership sort of stands out for me in the campaign as a way of showing exactly how we go about working with others, how we invest in relationships, how we importantly listen and collaborate uh, with others and then actually deliver. I co-chaired with Fiji political negotiations around a critical development framework for the SIDS called the Samoa Pathway. But we also invested with them, working with the Marshall Islands in leading the work on youth and um, climate mobilization, public mobilization at the climate summit last year. And then very importantly, we actually showed that the commitment to this, these SIDS, who are a very vulnerable, fragile group of countries in the UN, that it wasn't just a commitment for the election season. I think that was a critical factor. So over the course of the two years, in close collaboration with them, we actually worked on this with the SIDS. We developed Ireland's first ever five-year strategy for a partnership with the small island developing states. And this has actually been reflected in the recent program for government. It's a, it's a partnership with substance and it mattered. And I think it illustrated to people what we're like when we set our minds to developing partnership. And then the third element I mentioned, the third distilled value, if you like, um, empathy. That was actually the value we debated most when we were originally sketching out our campaign. There was a worry certainly here, and I think maybe in Ivy House as well, that it was a little too vague, difficult to communicate. And the brilliant John Concannon helped us think that through. 
um, we decided we'd go ahead with the concept as a core value because Ireland at the UN really has an empathy for the struggle, struggle of others. And I think that's an empathy that really isn't shared by many, if any, uh, developed countries. In hindsight, I think it was a very persuasive thought. Um, as a small country sitting on the periphery of Europe, I think we seem to reflect the experience of many small and some larger countries here at the UN. Uh, we had a bloody hard won fight for independence ourselves, followed by a civil war before we found our foot, our foot uh, footing on the global stage. And we like to say that we grew up here at the UN in that uh, development. We also see then through that UN prism that it was the international order that protected us in our early days, but also, I like to say, gave, allowed us to give full expression to that hard won sovereignty. And that's a struggle that some countries here at the UN are still going through. Um, it connected us with many voters, I think, in the election in a way that Norway and Canada just would have more difficulty doing because of their national narratives. Our own experience on conflict and the peace process that followed through the Good Friday Agreement ending the conflict means that we also understand, I think like few others, just how difficult uh, building and then how difficult sustaining peace is and that it's an ongoing process. Again, something that very much registered empathetically, I think, with, with our um, colleagues here. So we managed to weave uh, that national experience into what I think was a credible narrative. And I think it explains a bit also to people why we tend not to lecture. We tend not to point our fingers. We're more in the line of encouragement and support. And I think most people would accept that empathy pervades much of what we do here at the UN. I mean, we, we would argue that Irish aid um, is at the forefront, really, as the manifestation of that empathy. Um, we've ourselves nationally just recently, relatively recently at least, come through the trauma of mass migration, something many here are coping with. Um, poverty, our own famine, still a, a living memory. Um, we honour that memory through a development programme that really uh, allows us to deliver for the most vulnerable and for the least developed. And that's something that's deeply respected here. We, we tend to argue that for Ireland, that experience has um, bred a humanity in our approach. And it echoed for me, certainly, in many conversations in the UN. I would say, though, I think probably the most effective demonstration of our empathy is our peacekeeping record. Over 60 years, we have an unrivaled, unbroken record of peacekeeping. And while, to be blunt about it, many developed countries talk a lot about peacekeeping, few send their daughters and their sons into the field as Ireland does. Measured on a per capita basis, uh, we are by far the biggest troop contributor in the Western group of countries here. And many were frequently astounded when I would say that 13% of Irish Defence Forces at any one time are in the field wearing uh, that blue beret. So uh, UN mandated missions are critical to what we do. So there, despite some sort of early misgivings about how we would knit in that empathy factor uh, in the end of the campaign, I think colleagues saw it really as something not just that we pervade, uh, that we bring to our business in a daily basis, but that we would actually also bring to the Security Council table. So that's sort of a broad brush on uh, what mattered in the, in the shaping of the campaign. Now, of course, uh, now we have what we wished for, we have our seat. Uh, so uh, what awaits us looking ahead now? Um, I'll say a little bit about the Council and what I perceive as the sort of the shape of the challenges. Um, a bit of a cliche, frankly, but I'll say it anyway. The world has changed. The council has changed a lot since we sat there 20 years ago. The council itself now has a, an enormous workload. Um, we're dealing with about 30 live ongoing crises that are euphemistically called country situations. So Syria, Libya, Mali, through to peace process in, in uh, Colombia, ongoing challenges in Afghanistan, a long list. There's also about 20 areas of what they call cross-cutting thematic issues that actually feed into both security and security threats. So issues like children in armed conflict, terrorism, women, peace and security, just to, to name a few of them. 
naturally, given the nature of things, uh, there's been a steady increase in just the day-to-day -day business the council gets on with. Back 20 years ago, the council had about 400 meetings uh, when Richard Ryan was here in the, in the chair, and that was very busy. Uh, it was 9-11. It was an edgy time internationally. Um, two years ago, that was already at 600 meetings a year. So um, the numbers are, are growing, um, certainly. And it, in addition to the basic workload of the council, um, you'd have to recognise that the global context and critically I would underline the dynamic within the council itself um, has dramatically changed. In the immediate term, uh, goes without saying, the challenge of responding to COVID uh, is right front and centre. Um, the consequences for international peace and security of COVID, probably we couldn't say we know what they are exactly yet, but they'll undoubtedly preoccupy the council for some time to come one way or another. Only last week, I'm sorry to say, after almost four months, the council itself managed to pass a resolution in response to COVID. Now, the fact that it took four months of the council's engagement, and they were actually engaging on this for four months, the fact that it took so long to agree um, on what's an unprecedented global threat by any reckoning, um, really um, shows you the scale of the challenge internally in the Security Council. You know, the truth is that that was largely due uh, to the sharp differences uh, between the US and China. Um, but it, um, it also points to the wider challenging dynamic in the Council, I think. And if I wanted to add a little colour to that dynamic for flavour, you could just think, for example, unfinished business between the UK and Russia, US opposition to defense of the JCPOA on Iran, and um, India and China's recent tensions in the Himalayas. We have US, uh, Russia, Chinese tensions on Syria, Libya, US um, positioning on climate and climate security. So the list is long and the tensions are, are clear. What's also clear is that on a day-to-day -day basis, the complex and protracted crises on the council agenda, like Syria, Yemen, Libya, the Sahel, they have become deeply entangled uh, with global geopolitics. And in my view, that puts millions at risk and brings instability far beyond the regions where the actual crises are happening. Now, the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, by definition, bear a huge responsibility in that, but they're not alone in that. It's no secret that the geopolitics behind these crises are being played out in the Council at the table. Some would say that relations between the US, China and Russia at the Council table are possibly at an all-time low. Um, and we will have new dynamics, uh, big powerful countries coming onto the council with Ireland, countries like India and Mexico will also add a new complexity to the dynamic of the council. So we we're, we're know that ourselves as we join the council this year or next year, uh, that we'll need to steer a very focused and I think a careful course if we are to succeed in making what we want to be a meaningful contribution during what actually in two years is a short time on the Security Council. Now look, we're determined to make our mark. I've always said here that we're not going to go to the Council to make up numbers. Uh, we'll be realistic, but we'll be ambitious as well. And um, we'll go in there looking to solve problems and to try and get things done. We, we are lucky that we have a principled, we have a consistent, and we have an independent foreign policy. And we have government that is not afraid to stand up or to speak out. I um, have to admit, of course, that the reality is we don't know exactly what the issues are that will face the Council between 2021 and 2022. But I'll now just say, uh, before concluding, a few words on the sort of the basic principles that we'll sort of bring as our angle of entry into the council, it's very difficult to be too forensic looking this far ahead. The first I'd mention is just the simple concept of building peace. I mean, that is our basic job on the Security Council. We will now be at the table uh, shaping the mandates for missions where Irish peacekeepers are deployed, um, where we'll be deciding on how modern peacekeeping missions uh, are shaped, um, they have to adapt to the changing nature of conflict, 
each mandate is debated, resolutions agreed, we'll be at the table doing that. And we'll also be looking at how countries transition from peacekeeping environments with missions on the ground to building more sustainable long-term peace and structures to support them like we've done, for example, in Liberia. Um, I think our membership of the European Union will also serve us as a powerful connector. We'll be amplifying political messages and using the considerable European Union heft in development, in investment, to support a sort of collective action. And importantly, I see that as really valuable in that space they like to call a nexus here between development and peace building. We'll also use our membership of the Security Council, I hope, to really build up our partnership with the African Union. 60% of the work of the Security Council is focused on the great continent of Africa. We know from our own experience in Ireland that international partnership alongside locally led solutions offers a sustainable path to peace. We support African solutions to African problems, but we want also to be a constructive goodwill partner in that. And I think we'll be uniquely placed uh, to reinforce the peace building roles and relationship of two big regional actors, the African Union and the European Union. They both have capacity and mandates and we'll play our role in there. We also will stress that uh, building peace needs to be inclusive. It's not actually the preserve of governments or parties to conflict. It really has to include civil society. We've always spoken out here for civil society. Young people need to be involved. Women should be at the table from the outset throughout the peace process. We know from evidence from our own national experience that when women are included in peace process and peace building, that peace actually lasts longer. I like to say more women, more peace, but it's not a case, as Fanula Nielon often says, of adding women and stirring. We want to see women at, decision, at the peace tables in decision-making roles, not add-ons after the event. We also know that building inclusive societies and institutions actually is a bulwark against insecurity. And if you look at the population, again, going to the great continent of Africa, 60% of the African population is under 25. So for us, building security on that continent means engaging youth and involving young people in discussions around peace and security. We can't exclude them, and certainly Ireland will include youth in the discussions. Second principle that we're bringing with us to the table is really focusing on strengthening prevention. So going uh, upstream, as it were, uh, in, in conflict situations. Today is shocking 168 million people need humanitarian assistance. I mean, for me, that's the you could say the unspeakable side of the, the cost of conflict. Um, so we're convinced that the Security Council isn't living up to uh, what it should do in that regard and must do more. And we, we're determined to try and make a difference in that. We want to reinforce the conflict prevention side of the Council's work. And by that, I mean a more proactive uh, prevention, conflict prevention activity. Um, that may involve horizon scanning, early alerts. They're sensitive and difficult issues, but they're probably necessary. Mediation. We want to see quickly stepping in, not spending months and months to find the right name or the right mechanisms. We need to get in and get in early enough to make a difference. Um, Non-proliferation and disarmament, so well known in Irish foreign policy. We still believe that nuclear disarmament is an enormous um, uh, obligation of, the, uh, of all members of the Council, though not universally shared clearly on the Council. And we will work to prevent small arms proliferation, which we see, for example, in the Sahel, it's causing untold complex um, conflict. When it comes to conflict prevention, I think we also will have to look more at the drivers of conflict. And there for us, there'll be two that we will focus in on, food security or food insecurity and climate. I mean, trite uh, statement to say hunger continues to grow. It's often driven by conflict, but in turn, it drives conflict itself. It fuels conflict. Just facts, uh, two thirds of the 74 million people in the world who suffer from acute hunger are in 21 countries which are regarded as conflict 
uh, fragile, insecure environment. So there are clear links between the two. On climate change, for us, the evidence is, the, the evidence is absolutely clear. Man-made climate change drives insecurity and instability. We've heard this over and over again from small islands, from developing countries, from countries like Namibia with desertification problems still. This is a live issue that needs to come to the council. In our view, if we don't understand the structural drivers of conflict and security, it's very hard for us to address them. The last and the third uh, uh, principle that we are building into our approach is ensuring accountability. There's no doubt about it uh, that on a daily basis, respect for humanitarian law internationally is being eroded. When respect is given, we see facts show that lives are saved. Um, on the other hand, when international humanitarian law is abrogated, is ignored, lives are shattered. And too often we're now seeing indiscriminate attacks on civilians, on maternity hospitals, on health workers. So we see that humanitarian um, uh, work as critical. We're seeing some humanitarians denied life-saving access themselves. Cruel political games, and I just be blunt about that, are being played not just on the ground, but also at the Security Council table. Vital permissions for humanitarian action are being delayed or refused. Um, humanitarian workers are often deliberately targeted, kidnapped. We've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, murders. This, <clears throat> this we see as inexcusable. And where international human law is, humanitarian law is violated, we absolutely are convinced that the Security Council needs to be of clearer voice and to be proactive. It can't stand idly by, as its members on occasion, I'll be blunt, have been almost splitting hairs to protect allies or proxies on the ground. So we will speak up and stand up on those issues. That will mean focusing on humanitarian and human rights law, but it means, in, in real terms, it means protecting civilians in conflict, ensuring border crossings for humanitarian access, fighting against impunity. Um, I can just mention Syria, Libya, Yemen, and you, you get the picture in those regards. It also means, I think importantly for some of you listening this morning, that humanitarian aid agencies, including the world leading Irish organizations who are out there in the field, that we will work to ensure that they can continue to provide vital life-saving support where it's most needed. And finally, it does mean bringing perpetrators to account. We will support the institutions that have the capacity to do that. And we're working, for example, now already on the international impartial and independent mechanism for Syria. We'll also, of course, and many of you will, will recognize this, we'll be paying very close attention to specific country crisis situations. Syria and Yemen get a lot of uh, focus and we will continue that work. But we know that today, as we speak, the situation in, in Libya is highly precarious. We're also strongly focused on making progress on the Middle East peace process. Minister Simon Coveney has been a leading international voice on this. And I would fully expect that to continue and indeed to be reinforced while we're actually on the Security Council. So all of that is a flavor of our day-to-day -day work. Um, we'll also have a couple of big opportunities, distinctive moments as it were, when we'll be president of the Security Council. Certainly one, which will be in September of next year, 2021. The second one is a possible, probable one at the end of 2022 because the elections for the Security Council next year could change that slightly. But those special months or month as president of the Security Council, every member gets one, one presidency at least, um, allows a country to shape the agenda, to take centre stage and to highlight priority areas. Truth is, of course, we know what happens to best laid plans. There will be unexpected crises. Uh, there's no knowing, but our Falklands Malvinas moment will be our September 11 moment. The known unknown is probably that we'll have at least one, if not more than one, to cope with. So my fervent wish as I settle back into uh, leading the team here in New York is that I hope we can prove ourselves to be effective and credible influential players. 
uh, we're going to arrive there on the 1st of January well prepared, agile and ready to respond come what may. Um, we don't underestimate the task um, and I think it's fair enough to say we don't plan to shy away from it. We sought the seat really because we sincerely believe it's a responsibility we should, we should shoulder. But I'd also say it's an opportunity that we can seize to do the right thing when I think many others are actually challenged in doing that. So it's a big daunting job and we're looking forward to working with all of you, not just our mission network, but right across government and with the Oireachtas, civil society, academe, and probably all of you who are out there, we'll ask you to keep faith with us as we go, knowing that we're gonna use every chance every day to shine a light outward from that great small island you're on that I miss, uh, but that I'm very proud to represent. So Michael, slightly longer than you planned maybe, but thanks very much. Well, the great virtue of the length of what you said, Geraldine, is that you've anticipated most of the questions that are actually uh, in front of me at this stage, but we'll, we'll get to them uh, as many as we can in the time remaining to us. But maybe just uh, one that just came in uh, a second ago from Gillian uh, Van Turret, uh, the public affairs consultant and former senator, indeed, uh, in addition to congratulating you. Uh, she wants to know what will success look like for Ireland when we come off the Security Council or indeed come to evaluate our role on the Security Council in early uh, 20, uh, 2023. So I suppose what, what, what will be success? Uh, and I suppose um, maybe that, and maybe just come to, uh, just link that with a question uh, uh, that Porrick Murphy, uh, a former colleague of ours, and of course a member of the Institute and the chair of our, our um, foreign policy uh, uh, group, he, he wants to know, um, he has suggests that the Security Council, of course, hasn't really shone in recent years. And is it fundamentally deadlocked? Obviously, we know of recent deadlocks um, this year in more recent years, but is there a, is there a serious uh, impossible deadlock there to, to, to overcome? Thank, thanks, Michael. Hello to Gillian, uh, whom I worked with very much in the past, uh, including in Brussels and Dublin. Um, a good question, Gillian, of course, our legacy. And this is something I have to say that we have been thinking about almost during the campaign, uh, not just that we'll wait for the last couple of weeks at the end. I think our successful um, uh, legacy or a legacy we'd like to leave is that we've been true to that independent voice that I mentioned um, uh, in my remarks and that we have kept faith with those who gave us the trust to sit there for them. They are the more vulnerable members uh, who will never sit on the council. At the moment, for example, the small island developing states the smallest country ever was elected to the Security Council last year, doing a tremendous job, Vincent and the Grenadines, but they rarely get a moment and they have existential challenges. Will those SIDs come to us at the end of our time and say, we stood by them and spoke up for them? Well, I mentioned that our development program uh, very much focused on the least developed and those furthest behind. In many cases, they are women and young people. And Gillian, I know your own uh, attachment to ensuring that youth have a voice. Um, we will, I think, be measured by the degree to which we're seen not to be a, a classical foreign policy machine, but an inclusive member state that actually brings the voices of those grassroots people who are involved in building peace locally. And I'd also say I'd like to be measured by how we reinforce Ireland's role um, in two other areas, not just our humanitarian human rights, which of course uh, will remain solid, but also on our peacekeeping front that we can bring some of our own experience to the table and maybe improve some of the, what are difficult enough challenges on shaping peacekeeping mandates and the nature of peacekeeping evolving now and, uh, and certainly come back to our roots on non-proliferation. Um, Porrick Murphy, uh, great to have a question from you, uh, dear Porrick, uh, one of the, uh, the great elders of, of the foreign affairs family. Um, Por um, the answer to your question, is it fundamentally deadlocked? I'd have to say no, otherwise, I mean, the faith and the hope that I would have doing this job would be, would be very minimalistic. It's, it's, frankly, it is quite dysfunctional and challenged right now. I mentioned the broader tensions largely between the permanent members. But one thing to bear in mind is that there are five permanent members. They are not the Security Council. We've spent 15 years becoming an elected member. There are 10 elected members. 
there have recently been significant evolutions where what they call the E10, the elected 10 members of the council, are playing a much more, I would say, influential and persuasive, in some cases, decisive role in, in the Security Council. You remember that the Security Council cannot make any decision, take any action, without nine votes. So in every action, even if the P5 agreed tomorrow on a large agenda, without the elected members, they can't act. We were seeing this month, as a concrete example, an issue on climate and security that's very challenged on the Security Council, but the German presidency of the Security Council has made this a priority, and they managed to have 10 members signing up for a discussion. They won't get a resolution across the line. Why? Because part of the, we would see the dysfunctionality of the council is that one or two members will use a veto. Um, but the fact is that the council has ways of doing business. And Pork, the last thing I'll say is that though the big picture tends to be those moments around the horseshoe table with people raising their hands and vote, a huge amount of serious work day to day is done on the ground behind the scenes you know, working on the humanitarian issues I mentioned. So, no, it's it's not without hope by any means. Um, it does mean it's an ongoing challenge every single day, but that's what we signed up for. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, just to uh, come to the question of uh, who supported us in the end of the day, um, uh, of course, the secret ballot, we, we know that, but I think I, I saw reference to the Tanishta, uh, Tanishta suggesting that we had very strong support from among the Arab states. Uh, but of course, uh, with 128 votes, it 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 it, it, um, it was global in our, our our support. But there's a question here from from Declan Keane of uh, an advisory partner of KPMG, uh, who says that the vote from Arab uh, member states was excellent. Uh, and what was behind this was the leadership on the status of women, Palestine, or something else. Uh, so I suppose again, uh, where did we get our support from, and did we get support at, from closer at home as we might expect uh, from within our European Union? Uh, how strong, you know, not knowing, of course, uh, given the nature of the secret ballot, but uh, how strong do you uh, expect our support was from within the our, our nearest and dearest and close to the hand? Uh, thanks, Michael. Well, of course, if I could see under that lid as to who voted for us and who didn't, um, I'd be a very happy woman. Uh, but with 128 votes, as you point out, Michael, the fact is we had support right across the board in the UN. You couldn't get 128 two-third majority without actually having strong support in every single region. Um, naturally, we would expect that we had strong support uh, from our European partners and friends. Um, we're part of a Western group of whom not all EU members are, are members of the Western group. Just a little uh, thing to mention here that uh, uh, 10 of our members are members of the Eastern European group. So, uh, but we had, we had strong support there. Declan raised the Arab group in particular, 128 votes. There are 22 members of the Arab group. Um, I think we had strong support, very strong support. The issue of Ireland's role and the very constructive role, particularly that Minister Simon Coveney has played recently on trying to advance the peace process in the Middle East, has really been a, a very strong uh, aspect of Ireland's foreign policy here. In 2018, we led here in New York uh, a resolution on the Middle East peace process, and that had almost universal support in December 2018 in the General Assembly. So our credentials on the Middle East are well known and well respected. We're also a country that, of course, has a representation in Israel. We have a partnership with Israel. We're well able to talk to both uh, Arab and Israeli friends. And we always argue that the two-state solution within internationally agreed parameters um, is in the interests of both Israel and Palestine and indeed of the Arab region as a whole. You can imagine in the context of this campaign that the prospect of possible annexation in the, in the West Bank played a large part in people's minds. The idea that that would actually be a live issue on the Security Council table. And of course, our views on that have been well expressed by the, the government, by Tisha Tonishta, um, so you're familiar with that. We, we, Michael, you know, I mentioned the small island developing states, the African group, where I, I have to say, in respect of the enormous work, not just that our embassies, but we, I think we have less than a dozen missions in Africa at the moment you know, in a, in, a, in a region that has 54 countries in the UN, 
I think the work of our non-governmental organizations was an enormous, um, I would say, bolstering of Ireland's reputation over decades on the ground. Kofi Annan said uh, something that has been repeated back to me so often here, and it, it helped us in the election, and that is that our Irish non-governmental actors on the ground, they're not there just when the lights are on and the crisis is raging. As Kofi Annan said, when you switch off the lights and people leave, the Irish are still there. And I think that helped us hugely in an Africa group where I go back to that point about authenticity and surety. We're consistent. We don't go when you switch off the, the lights and the media bus rolls out of time. We're still there. Very good, Geraldine. Um, just uh, maybe uh, just come back to uh, the European Union, uh, if I may, uh, and question, a few questions in, in relation to that, including one from our former colleague, Bobby uh, McDonough. He says during the campaign, how important was Ireland's membership of the European Union and how important will it be as we carry out our, our, our Security Council mandate? And I suppose apropos of which, I mean, the voice that we will be articulating within the European, within the Council, it's Ireland, but obviously is it Ireland uh, plus the plus the EU, or is it some sort of a hybrid uh, in, in current circumstances, or is it uniquely uh, national? Thanks, Bobby. Uh, wish I, I I can't see you, but I can hear that question uh, in in your in your own tone. Um, look, uh, it was a very important aspect of our uh, campaign. It's an, it's a hugely important aspect of who and what we are, um, not just in Brussels, but here in the in the uh, UN. Um, we certainly, um, you know, are seeing now a real evolution in terms of the, I would say, the perception as well as the, the presence of the EU on the uh, Security Council. Uh, this year we have uh, elected members, Belgium, uh, Germany, Estonia, along and uh, alongside France. So we have four EU members sitting there right now. Um, interestingly, they, they have, uh, just for alphabetical reasons, the Estonians, French and the Germans followed each other with their presidencies of the, of the Security Council. So they were calling this a European spring. So people perceive European presence as something, not a block vote. And I will say during the campaign, this came up a little bit, sometimes in a defensive way with us. Will you just be a voice for a European position as opposed to that independent voice that I mentioned? But I've, I've already touched on two areas that show that when it matters, we stand up. Ireland on the Middle East, for example, is a leading and more, I would argue, more progressive positioning. We bring the EU along with us as much as we can there on disarmament, nuclear issues, clearly not a shared EU position, but we're clearly um, you know, a, a fully signed up, paid up member of the European Union. And when it comes to the voice of the union on human rights, on international humanitarian law, bringing development on the ground, the EU is in 140 of the 193 countries. You know, that's just uncontestable by way of partnership. So it's a distinctive voice challenges for the European Union now, Bobby. So I hope that we actually um, prove our mettle as a good European um, member on the Council, because in 2022, um, we will be home alone with France. So we will be the only elected EU member on the Council. So that's quite a big drop from, if you go back uh, even 18 months ago, where there were five members, and of course the UK in and out of the European Union is a factor in counting who's at the table. And I'll just finish off saying uh, on the European Union, Bobby, that uh, we have adopted, and I've had my first, my maiden outing here in an EU stakeout after a sensitive debate. So Ireland stands with the EU member states now as an incoming member of the council, making statements on issues, and we did it on the Middle East. So it's an important issue, yeah. Okay, uh, Geraldine, I'm just watching the time here. So uh, we're just gonna get into a few more questions if we can in the, uh, the several minutes available to us and um, so uh, two from uh, current uh, resident ambassadors here one from Mexico and one from uh, Cyprus and I just uh, summarize them I suppose as uh, particularly Mexico I suppose as an incoming elected member like ourselves uh, is looking forward to working with Ireland on the council there are many topics which we can work on together but I would like to ask the ambassador uh, uh, could she expand on the work that can be done on issues related to gender perspective to empower women and girls in all aspects of the international peace and security agenda. And then a second one, and not necessarily related, uh, 
from the Ambassador of Cyprus. Uh, could the Ambassador, uh, in addition to congratulating Ireland on the election, he said, could the Ambassador elaborate on Ireland's views on the future of peacekeeping missions, taking into consideration existing issues with funding, but also the possible economic consequences of um, the the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and I think there's a question also on how we see C19 uh, crisis interfacing with the aims and principles that you set out, Geraldine, coming from um, Michael McCarthy from uh, Michael Michael McCarthy Flynn uh, of Oxfam Ireland. So they're kind of um, in some ways related. Two from uh, current ambassadors here, and a second from third one from Oxfam, and then we we'll end uh, appropriately, I think, with a, a question from Noel Dorr. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to the Ambassador of Mexico, um, the French have a lovely phrase, ça tombe bien, just as it happens. I had lunch with your colleague Juan Ramon here uh, this week in New York, uh, both of us looking ahead to what I think will be an excellent partnership between us on the Council. And indeed, we discussed an area that has been growing and our own ambassador, indeed, Barbara Jones in, in Mexico, has been working on this, I know, uh, locally as well, which is the whole question of the, the gender uh, aspect of building peace. Um, we, uh, Juan Ramon and I, the other day were discussing, in particular, the women, peace and security. I called these cross-cutting themes when I spoke earlier. But women, peace and security, famously a resolution 1325, most translated, most debated ever resolution at the Security Council, sets out essentially the irrefutable, uh, which is that we absolutely won't be able to build international sustained peace without women's engagement. And the role that Mexico is now playing in what we're calling generation equality, this is a critical year. It's uh, uh, the 20th anniversary of that resolution. It's the 25th anniversary of the Beijing conference. It's the 10th anniversary of UN Women. It's a big year for gender and policy. And Mexico and Ireland plan to work in very close partnership on that. We would love to have I, I hope a leading role uh, together on women, peace and security on the council. Um, Michael, um, the ambassador of Cyprus, I have to say, um, we have a wonderful former ambassador of Cyprus, uh, Andreas Mavrianus, serving as my colleague here in New York. So uh, your question, of course, on peacekeeping, a really important one. Um, we, we're very concerned about the financing of peacekeeping, uh, which is an issue that affects all peacekeeping missions and indeed Andreas has done extraordinary work here in the last months trying to settle some of those issues, some of which are related to bigger funding of the UN debates, but also, also there is a, a really unfinished piece of business on the funding of AU, uh, African Union led um, and finance peacekeeping operations. You know, without getting into the, 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 the nitty gritty of this, we believe that we should never see spending restrictions as putting a limitation on how we can put in a safe way our peacekeepers on the field. We've had, uh, as you know, uh, Ambassador, um, a long history in UNFISIP uh, with you uh, in Cyprus. We bring that um, absolute concern uh, to the table wherever we put Irish peacekeepers uh, out there. And I think you mentioned, uh, if I'm not wrong, COVID in, in passing. It, that there has been an amazing challenge um, in managing peacekeeping operations through COVID, which will help shape thinking about future mandates. We've been engaged here very much in looking at how you rotate in and out, how you protect not just the peacekeepers, but how they play a role also in protecting the community and, you know, in, in difficult times in ensuring that the, the, the wider inclusive part of uh, their role locally at community level is also protected when social distancing and safety issues are, are paramount. I'm sorry I missed the Oxfam question, Michael. What was the Oxfam? And again, related to COVID, how do you see C19 uh, crisis interfacing with the aims and principles you set out? I mean, I suppose the... the yeah, look, I mean, it, it, it's, it's fundamentally difficult. Uh, you know, it's affected the way we're doing business here, but it's also... Obviously, I heard Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General, just last night talk about the extraordinary lengths the UN has gone to keep a critical mass of humanitarian actors in place safely. Again, a bit the rotating in and out, ensuring that people have access to basic PPE so that 
just the resident representatives in developing countries that are, as I said earlier, and Oxfam knows this more than anyone, you know, very fragile contexts where health systems are in some cases non-existent. So there's a huge job of work. And I think we are going to be dealing with this, the socioeconomic impacts as well as the health impacts for a long time. Okay, Geraldine, we're just coming up on two o'clock. So we're just going to take the finale of the question, if I may, uh, or if we may, from Noel Nodor, who, of course, former Secretary General and a former uh, a predecessor of yours, uh, indeed, on the council back in the 19, early 1980s. So Noel um, wants to pass on his congratulations, obviously, as we all do. Um, uh, and he wants to know uh, if uh, the practice of prolonged consultations in a small room behind the council chamber still continues. And he said in his time, long ago, it allowed members of the Perm 5 uh, to threaten a veto while avoiding criticism for actually using it in the full council. So that's literally a behind the scenes question. Noel, uh, great to have a question from you, a real honor indeed. And uh, I have to tell you that um, no doubt about it, your small state at a top table volume is literally my bedside reading. I can't tell you how often I've consulted that uh, during the campaign. And yes, that small room exists. I, you know, a tail out of school here, I was here as a young diplomat and I used to wait in the outer room so I never actually saw inside that little room until about 12 months ago when I was bringing a minister I think it was Catherine Zapone was on a tour of the Security Council and somebody said would you like to see that small inner room and very frankly I got a terrible shock because uh, Noel as you know all too well and Richard will know it's tiny so you really are it's not like being in a big corporate room in Brussels it's very much nose to nose toe to toe so it's a very intimate setting, but you're right, Noel, it is still used hugely, actually. Um, you know, that, that uh, gathering in public is the tip of the iceberg, and the work behind the scenes there in that small room does allow, as you say, threatening vetoes uh, and, uh, you know, some banging of drums that then maybe occasionally relieves the pressure. I will say, just as an aside on that, Looking at the intimacy of the room, it also registered with me something that's fundamental, which is that the personal relationships between the members, the permanent representatives of the council, matter hugely. You know, you're literally looking across the table at these people, so you can't avoid them. So one of my, uh, my uh, tasks, of course, will be to sit comfortably with all of the, the members. I don't anticipate a problem. And I'll actually have my first experience, not in the little room, no, but next week, um, the, uh, the Russian Federation annually holds an away day for all members, including elected members, to have what they call sofa discussions. So I'll be embarking on my, my mini effort uh, of that small room, Noel. Um, I might give you a call or a Richard a call for notes before I go. But uh, you're right, that room exists and I'm uh, looking forward to it with a, an element of anticipation. Well, Geraldine, you've been very generous with your with your time, indeed, and with your just your discourse. It's been a fantastic um, uh, tour de force and uh, just presentation uh, of what what lies ahead, and indeed uh, how how we've got to the point that we're in at the moment. So again, just congratulations. We hope we hope you will come back maybe at the halfway stage, <laughs> so that we can uh, do a little progress report maybe uh, um, uh, towards the end of next year. Uh, but in the meantime, obviously, we want to really extend to you our very best. We now know, I think, why. 128 countries could not possibly say no and had to say yes. The, one is, the wonder is it's only 128. But listen, congratulations. It's a huge responsibility. It's a huge honour. And, um, and obviously, we wish you all the very best as you represent Ireland in those corridors and in those small rooms or in those rooms big and small uh, at the UN over the, next, um, over the next period on the Security Council. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Michael, and to all of those who listened, uh, bore with me. Uh, keep faith with us. I look forward to being at that halfway stage. Can't imagine what it will be like, but you know that we'll do our absolute best to represent you and all those who were generous enough to elect us. Uh, so look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Charlie.